<laughs> Good evening and welcome. Uh, this is the meeting of the Special Education Advisory Committee for the Holton District School Board on Tuesday, the 7th of March, 2023. In accordance with Ontario Regulation 463-97 and the guidelines effective February the 1st, 2021, HDSB promotes community engagement and participation by having processes in place for members of the public to ask questions. A Google form was attached to the agenda and is on the SEAC website page in case there are any questions that come up. Questions posed during live stream meetings of SEAC may be answered during the meeting, particularly if they're related to the agenda items or at the following meeting at the discretion of the chair. For efficiency, multiple questions received that are similar of nature may be grouped together at the discretion of the chair and or vice chair. Questions will not be attributed. Notation will be made that multiple people ask the same question. Any questions that contain hateful or discriminatory language will not be considered. So first of all, we'll start with a roll call to record who is in, in attendance. Please answer yes or present. Uh, Naveed Ahmed. Okay. So joining shortly. Okay. Carol Baxter. Present. Uh, Joanna Oliver. Okay. okay. Kate Lombacher. Did I see that? No, yeah. There we go, Catherine. Is okay. There? Uh, Sarika Kanithi. Present. Allison. I'm present. <laughs> um, Diane. But, sorry, this is Catherine Lambacher. I am present. I'm not, I'm, my mute, unmute was not functioning. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, Diane Vandenbosch. Vandenbosch. Nadina Torek. Present. Evelyn Bercy. Present. Melissa Dockery. She's waiting to be let, she's online, um, said she's waiting to be let in. Okay. Okay. Uh, Sarah Lansley. Yes, here. Hi. Sophia Siddiqui. She's trying, she's waiting to be let she's online as well. She's waiting to be admitted. Yeah. Okay. Um, Sophia. Sophia and uh, Melissa. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We're just trying to work on getting you in. Uh, Rebecca Huron. Yes, I'm here. I'm in now. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Kathy Turner. Here, present. Aaron Spruill. Nope. Kaisa Klassen. Present. Schleifer. Myself, present. Melissa Summer. Present. Colette Roddick. No, oh, we already did that. Yep. And Lorna. So we've got David in place for Colette and yep. uh, Lorna. Good room. Lorna. That's Perfect. Great. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I think we're just uh, trying to let the final members of SIAC into the meeting uh, from remote, and hopefully they'll be with us any moment now. Uh, but while we're waiting, we'll begin by honouring the land. Holton, as we know it today, is rich in history and modern traditions of many First Nations and the Métis. From the Anishinaabe to the Adawandaran, the Haudenosaunee and the Métis, these lands surrounding the Great Lakes are steeped in Indigenous history. As we gather today on these treaty lands, we have the responsibility to honour and respect the four directions, land, waters, plants, animals, ancestors that walked before us, and all the wonderful elements of creation that exist. We would like to acknowledge and thank the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation for sharing their traditional territory with us. Thank you. So our first step tonight is to approve the agenda for tonight's meeting. Hopefully you've all received that. Um, are there any modifications or amendments that need to be made to the agenda? If so, could you either raise your hand or indicate so in the chat box? Okay. 
Okay. Uh, would you like to move a motion to approve the agenda? Is anybody approve? Okay, Carol, thank Thanks, you. Carol. And then, um, would you like to second this motion? Okay, we've got Kaiser. Thank you. Um, does anybody, uh, since we've got people uh, online and in person, uh, does anybody who opposes the agenda as uh, so outlined, if they could make themselves known at this point in time? None being seen, the agenda is passed unanimously. Uh, secondly, um, we have the approval of our February 2023 minutes. Is there any errors or omissions that anyone wants to bring to our notice? Okay. Would you like to move a motion to approve the minutes? Thank you. So that's Nadina. Yep. And would you like to second this motion? Thanks, Carol. Carol will second the motion. Um, does anybody have any opposition to the minutes uh, as they've been recorded and provided to you? Uh, if so, um, could you let us uh, know uh, in either the chat or through a, your hand up? Okay, none being seen, the minutes are approved unanimously. Okay, we're still uh, trying to get a few people in, but um, in the meantime, we're gonna start moving on to our action items. Um, our first action item is um, initiative, uh, the Child First Initiative, and it's a presentation on, <laughs> is that all good? I apologize. We're having a hard time with our presenter from the Child First oh, Initiative. Okay. And so, so we're working on that. We sent a message. I wonder if maybe we might yeah, want to go to the next we'll go to this. We'll go to the next item. So uh, while we work on the technical aspects, as we said, um, we're three and a half years into this and we still <laughs> all have tech problems every single day. So that is just part of life. Um, so uh, Sophia and Rebecca, um, I think you are going to be presenting on the Holton Down Syndrome uh, Association. Are you able to present at this time? Hi, everyone. Yes, we are. We're so happy we made it in because both of us couldn't get connected. So great. all is well. All right. Well, I'll transfer over to you. Um, we're really excited to hear this presentation about the work that you do at your wonderful organization. Wonderful. Thank you. So, Lorna, we can go back a few slides, back to slide one. That'd be awesome. Perfect. Thank you so much. So again, uh, we're really excited um, to do this presentation. We are happy to also do it for the month of March because March is uh, part of World Down Syndrome Day. And I'll explain that a little bit later. But Sophia and I are both proud parents of a child with Down Syndrome. And we are blessed to, to be on this journey and to share it with you tonight. So thank you so much. We are a registered nonprofit charity uh, in the uh, region of Holton. Next, please. So in 1984, a group of six, uh, three couples, six people came together, all had children with Down syndrome and decided that they needed to bond together and share ideas and services and supports and um, just begin a community of, of people. And those same six members are actually still part of our association. They have grown children now of their own who have Down syndrome. They've been through the education system. They've been blessed by the supports that we have at the Halton District School Board and Halton uh, region. And they created a registered charity that will support other families and individuals with Down syndrome to bring apart uh, advocacy and education and a community awareness. We are not Hi, our children do not hide. We are out in the community. We do events. We go to bowling alleys. We go to movie theaters. We have our, our annual walk. Uh, we are proud, uh, a proud community of our, student, of our children. Our mission is to empower all individuals with Down syndrome at whatever stage in life they are at um, to really reach their full potential, um, regardless of what their uh, situation is. Next, please. 
So some of you might not actually know what Down syndrome is. It is a genetic condition. So it's a, uh, a, an extra copy of chromosome 21. So you all have two copies. Uh, people with Down syndrome have three, which uh, links to the third month of March, the 21st day, which is World Down Syndrome Day. So third month, 21st day to represent the three copies of chromosome 21. This genetic material, you either have it or you don't. Uh, as we know about, so it's, it, it elim eliminates the gray area uh, because there is genetic testing that's done upon birth. If a uh, physician uh, suspects Down syndrome, which was in our case, we didn't know, we didn't have a pre-diagnosis. So Evelyn was diagnosed at birth. Other families do have the opportunity if they choose to do uh, genetic testing and to do testing during utero, utero um, so they can prepare and begin the journey there. Uh, Down syndrome has some uh, physical characteristics uh, as well as their developmental characteristics, which is generally what we talk about when we um, are talking about students at SEAC who have Down syndrome. Uh, there's you know, a, a ride like there are in all of our um, learning disabilities and autism and all of those. We, there is a right, wide range. There is also some health concerns that come along with hearing and lungs and heart that sometimes can come along with individuals with Down syndrome. So those are often an added layer that some families uh, definitely need support with. And we're a small population. I always like to say we are small but mighty. Um, the ratios have not changed very much in, in the last 30 years, but it, uh, a child, one in 850 children in Canada are born with Down syndrome. So again, small but mighty. Some schools may never have a child with Down syndrome uh, come through their doors. And uh, that's certainly the case in our in my school, but we we know how blessed an experience it can be to teach, to educate, uh, and to have individuals with Down syndrome as part of a school community. Next. Okay, so I think an important message for tonight is that we should understand that each person with Down syndrome has different talents and the ability to thrive. And actually, I just realized we didn't introduce ourselves. So I'm Sophia Siddiqui, the SEAC rep for Halton Down Syndrome Association, and Rebecca. I'm Rebecca Huron, um, the alternate for Halton Down Syndrome. Awesome. So, yeah, so that, I think it's important to understand that while there's a genetic condition and, and that, they, each individual with Down syndrome brings their own talents. Uh, they are uh, individual different people. And so there is a huge range um, and a variety of talents and skills and challenges that the kids have. And so I think we want to just a reminder to everyone to, to avoid generalizing um, children with um, Down syndrome because, again, they are all unique just like all other children. Next slide, please. This is a really important point and something, you know, as a parent, it's it's really important to us. And I think um, in education, it's often forgotten. So we want to always remember it when speaking about anybody, any child with a disability, any any person with a disability, that we want to use people first language. So when somebody has a disability, you are talking about that and you're talking about them. You always want to say who they are before anything else. So, for example, this is my friend Ethan and he loves playing piano. This is Susie, and she has, she's really good at soccer. The same way you would say my friend Maggie has three older brothers. She also has Down syndrome. So you want to describe the person first and not their disability. So there has been a few moments at SEAC where Rebecca and I message each other. We're like, should we say something? They just said, you know, Down syndrome child or Down syndrome student. And it, it's something that we, we sort of cringe about. But again, when you know better, you do better. So we're hoping that today's um, slides and, and today's uh presentation will help all of us at SEAC learn that again when when talking about anybody or any child with with Down syndrome we never say the Down syndrome girl or the Down syndrome student right we always say the student with Down syndrome the child with Down syndrome the teenager with Down syndrome because it's people first okay so just a reminder for all of us and hopefully we can then take this back to our associations uh, and the people we we all know in our own networks and share that information next slide This is a very, very powerful and impactful resource. And I, I try every school that I speak to, I try and share this with, but this is the best platform I think to share this resource with. The Canadian Down Syndrome Society put together a learning together in the school community um, document. It's very, very thorough. They, they put a lot of uh, educators came together and put this together and it's the most amazing resource for schools to have. So they do have limited number of paper copies, but it's all online and digital. And I've linked it here in the slide deck. 
And basically, it's a guide for educators. There's a separate guide for educators, so how to teach a child with Down syndrome. Um, then there's a guide for peers in the classroom. There's a guide for principal and school leaders about how to um, help students with Down syndrome thrive in your school community. So excellent resource, and I highly recommend that you check it out. Um, and I, you know, a couple of points that I wanted to highlight today is, one, when we have our students with Down syndrome, we should always have high expectations, right? So I think that a lot has changed for our kids, and so perceptions need to change as well. Uh, back in the day, you know, a lot of kids with Down syndrome were told, well, they'll never learn to read, you know, they can't ride a bike, or they can't live independently or have a job. We know that uh, with early intervention, things have changed. So Rebecca and I, both of when we had our kids, you know, we had therapists at our door right away. So occupational therapy, physiotherapy, speech therapy starts right away at birth. You know, I, I mean, as soon as possible. And so what's happening now is that kids are able to do a lot more and accomplish a lot more than they had previously. But I think what we need to change is perception in society of what our kids can do. And so as an educator myself uh, and as a parent, I know that if I have high expectations for students, they will rise to those expectations, right? If I limit them in my classroom, then that's what they're going to achieve. So I think a message for, for everyone here today, too, is that kids with Down syndrome can accomplish so much, and so we definitely need to have high expectations. Secondly, we need to unlearn everything that you think you know about Down syndrome, because, uh, think, like I, as I mentioned, things have changed. So having an open mind about kids with Down syndrome and what they can do is so, so important. And I like to give the example of, you know, typically in high schools, one of the programs that they used to have is that, okay, kids with special needs or kids with Down syndrome are going to do cafeteria cleanup. And, well, you know, it was thought that this was a good thing because they're helping in the school community. If you really step back and, and look, look at that with criticality, you realize that how are their peers then going to view our kids with Down syndrome, right? Are they just going to see them as that's all they can do is they can clean up the cafeteria? But if we were to change that, right, raise the bar a little bit, maybe we have them doing the announcements. Maybe they can help lead an assembly. Maybe they can join a leadership club. So you're changing perceptions um, and then therefore having higher expectations. Uh, inclusion in our schools is so important for our students, uh, again, in every aspect. So they, they can join clubs. Absolutely, they can join the choir and they love to be a part of the school community. Um, they can join assemblies, leadership opportunities. There's lots of things that our students can do. But again, it comes back to that growth mindset and having high expectations for our kiddos. So uh, again, I highly recommend, you know, this uh, slide deck will be shared. I'll ask Lorna to email it to everybody. But this resource is very, very powerful um, for all kids with special needs. It's just really good um, educator practice. So it's a great resource to check out if you have time. Next slide, please. Okay, so when teaching a student with Down syndrome, attitude is the most critical factor related to the success of that student. If you think a student will succeed, they will. And when a student is treated like a valued learner, they learn. So it's so it's so simple and so obvious, yet I think it's something that we forget uh, in our school sometimes. I also want to highlight, these are our kiddos. So at the top here, you see Yusuf. Uh, that's my son. He goes to Odenawi School. He's in grade eight. And this year, I'm so happy that the principal um, really uh, was great with inclusion and he co emceed the winter concert and he loved that opportunity. So yes, his speech is not entirely clear, but with a partner friend in grade eight, they worked together, they put together a script and it was a very, very proud moment for our whole family and for the school to see. So for the entire audience to see, you know, there's a child with special needs, but you know what, he's up on stage and he's presenting and, and that I think is just the epitome of, um, you know, great inclusion. And that's our beautiful Evelyn. I'll, Rebecca, I'll let Rebecca speak to that. Thank you. This is Evelyn down on the bottom left. Evelyn is in grade five, uh, finishing off her last year at Sheridan Public School and then off to middle school at Falgerwood. Um, and Evelyn loves public speaking. So she loves to get in front of a microphone. She loves to be up on stage. She loves to be the center of attention. In grade four, she was chosen as one of her class representatives to do her speech. Um, her grade four speech on ice cream in front of the whole school and all of the parents. So she was very excited about that. And um, she, she does have EA support at school, but she absolutely loves going to school. She's excited to go off to middle school. And this year she was also chosen to be part of the school musical. They're doing Alice in Wonderland. Again, we wrote in a few extra lines for her. She wants to be part of it. Her friends are helping her, when, cue her when it's her turn to go, but she gets to be part of the experience and they get to see her flourish and her uh, be included in the school community. 
That's wonderful. So again, I, and these two are just a small um, percentage of the population of kids with Down syndrome in Halton. Uh, but again, I think that when you have inclusion and an open mindset, and I think if admin at the school and, and really at the board level, if we start to really promote inclusion uh, and share that with our um, special education departments, I think it really, really makes a difference, not just for our kids, but for the entire school community. Next slide. So as Halton Down Syndrome Association, we are one of the top three associations across Canada for our number of members, our activities, our support, our fundraising efforts, to that all that money goes back into our families. We're very fortunate to um, uh, collaborate with the Ontario Association as well as Sophia had said, the Canadian Down Syndrome Society. We work with all of our neighboring uh, associations and societies, Hamilton, Toronto, Peel, uh, we have events together, we share resources and supports. It's a very close-knit community because we are small in numbers, but a very strong community in our advocacy and our passion for our children and their, their life success and the advocacy of, of um, having them included in society and certainly into the school systems. You can go to the next slide, please, Lorna. We're also very proud about World Down Syndrome Day. So again, March 21st is World Down Syndrome Day. We encourage all of our schools where we obviously have students there. I am a teacher in Peel. I don't have any students at my school, but we all rock our socks on World Down Syndrome Day. We, we put up bulletin boards. We talk about inclusion. We talk about seeing the ability in all learners and making sure that people are aware of what Down syndrome is, even if they don't have somebody in their school, they will, as Sophia said, things are changing, uh, society is changing. Um, many more people with Down syndrome are getting jobs in our grocery stores and on, at Staples and in factories and workplaces. They're out in the community more using public transit and being self-sufficient and able to live on their own. So we wanna make sure that there is an awareness for all that when they come across someone with Down syndrome, they don't need to have that fear and those pre-existing um, opinions that they're more open. And that starts, like many things, starts in our schools. And we're very excited and very proud to see all of the celebrations that happen on March the 21st. Next slide, please. And just as we wrap up, we want to we encourage anybody who's here at the meeting tonight or who's joining us online to please connect with the Halton Down Syndrome Association. We've got a great website with resources for grandparents, parents, new parents. Um, we've got different aged groups. Our association is broken up into groups. So we've got new parents for any uh, like kind of zero to two who try, have a child, had a child born with Down Syndrome. We've got our elementary aged once they're into school. Then we've got our high school group and our graduates are what we call our um, anybody over the age of 21 who is not in the school system anymore and how we can support them. There is monthly newsletters that come out for all of those groups. There's activities, uh, music therapy, art therapies, bowling nights, swimming lessons. Uh, we just had on family day, we had a skating. We rented out a, an arena and we have a skating day. Again, we're getting into the community and we're showing the community that there's nothing to be scared about Down syndrome. They're just individuals like anybody else. They love to have fun. They love to interact. They're huge socialites most of the time and love to be around other people. I always say, if you're not sure, I'd rather you come and ask and talk and meet Evelyn than just stand there and stare at us because she is just like any other child and she has the same wants and needs and loves. So please, if you know of somebody that's looking for a connection, you know of a student in your school, uh, please encourage them to find us on Facebook, find the website Holton Down Syndrome Association and connect with us because we do have a lot of valuable information. Even though we are small in numbers, we are big in heart. So thank you so much. And if anybody has any questions, we would be glad to uh, answer. Thank you so much, everyone. That was wonderful. Thank you so much for informing us uh, about the work um, that your association does. It sounds as if you've got a wonderful kind of uh, community feel with uh, really able to support everybody on their journey. So amazing to hear about. Um, and uh, as you say, it's wonderful to see um, 
all people of different abilities uh, nowadays get out into the community and be more accepted for who they are and, and uh, for their difference and have that difference celebrated. So uh, it's great for you to highlight that tonight. Does anybody have any questions for Rebecca or uh, Sophia? Okay, yeah, so Mel saying, uh, love the presentation, language does matter. Yeah, so do we have N uh, Navid? Was that a hand up? Uh, yes, please. Uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, I really commend both the presenters. And it's uh, really very touching to know about about these uh, these kids and and especially the parents being a parent of four kids i can i can just relate with uh, with the challenges of raising kids and especially when when you have somebody who needs extra attention extra uh, care then uh, i i can only imagine what the parents go through and i don't know whether such as uh, like such support is in place or not but i strongly feel that there has to be some some sort of extra support for such parents um, just for parents, I'm not talking about the kids here because uh, they're already doing an awesome job taking care of these kids and 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 also uh, like uh, um, present presenting about their needs and and whatnot. So there has to be some some support for for parents because raising like absolutely normal 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 kids is is very challenging. So taking care of kids who need extra attention, extra care. Um, I think these parents should be should be just yeah given extra support. That's what I feel. Thank uh, you. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm getting too emotional here, but <laughs> but uh, you know what? Um, I can only imagine what these parents go through. Yeah. Well, that's what Thank we hope you. to provide through our association. Like it really is a community, and we support each other. And and I think what's important is that you know these needs are we advocate here, and we hope that the board hears. Uh, that the needs are out there and that, you know, these kids do need support uh, in our school systems. And more than anything, inclusion is the most important thing. Yeah, and absolutely. absolutely. I think, absolutely. I think you're right. Naveed, I think you're right that, uh, you know, all ch raising children in general is tricky, typical or neurotypical. Um, and we, as Sophia said, we do have a great parent network in the, in Halton Down Syndrome Association that supports each other. And, and I can say personally that because we've been blessed to have Evelyn in our lives, we have we have met along this journey families that we never would have ever met elsewhere. So it does bring a connection, even if we're out of our area, we're up at cottage country or we're in Florida or we're in Toronto and we walk through you know, a public place, people will stop us and, and have a conversation. And then you find out, oh, they're, you know, they have a sister with Down syndrome or they have a cousin with Down syndrome or they had the kid that grew up on the street that had Down syndrome and they have, there is that innate connection because, um, because of who, of who these children are and, and the importance that they have in our, in our society. So thank you so much for sharing. Was there another hand up? Okay. Catherine? Catherine? Hi, good evening. I just want to say, um, there's one. Okay. Um, I just want to say, um, what a wonderful presentation, and I agree with Sophia as well as Rebecca. Like my son goes to Odenawe, like they're in the same program. Yes. and I love the fact that how the principal at Odenawe and all the teachers are phenomenal. Like Cole being there, but anyways, I just want to say that's amazing. And getting to know Yusuf like through what Cole talks about, it's awesome. And being an EA at in Peel, I had a student with um in my old school like uh, Down syndrome, and I know. I got, she wanted to really be part of the school community. And so she actually did the winter concert as well. And I could tell from just watching the mom, she was so um, thankful and just like so proud. And she goes, she goes, I know my kid could do it, but now others can see that my kid can do the same thing. And I just want to say, I agree with everything you said. And that's it. I just love the presentation. Thank you, Catherine. And you know what? It's really important. I think, well, you know, Rebecca and I were both educators, so I think that we, you know, we bring a different lens. But I'll give you an example. I think it's important for, you know, our superintendent, everyone to hear is that, you know, this year um, at use of school, and of course, I'm an advocate for him. And, you know, we're lucky to have a principal that's open to that. But one of the things, so he is in life skills. So again, our students are both, many are in mainstream. Evelyn is in mainstream. Yusuf was mainstream until grade five. We moved into life skills for middle school. 
However, being in life skills, they are sometimes siloed, and I and I struggled with that. So, for instance, a school success teacher always works with grade eight students to help them transition to high school, but they never work with the kids in life skills class. You know, and so this year I kind of looked at that and said, well, let's 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 reevaluate that. Why not? You know, why don't they help to transition the kids in life skills? So we sat down at the school and, I, and we were able to work that into their schedule, schedule such that the teacher now is working with my son and another student in, in grade eight to help them with certain skills, with technology, Google, this and that, and, and some of those transition skills that other kids were getting. So I think as a as a board, too, we always need to be critical of our practice and, and there's always room for improvement. Um, you know, and so, so that I think it's the, the cert or the school success teacher said, you know, I've never done this before, but I think it's a great idea. So next time I have grade eight kids in the in the life skills class, I should also work with them for that transition. So absolutely, it's happening at our school because of the advocacy that we brought there. But I hope that, um, you know, somehow maybe, you know, superintendents here, if we can sort of share best practices like that with other schools, such that other grade eights in the life skills program can benefit from some of those specialty teachers. Because I do find sometimes our kids are in these programs and the contained programs, and sometimes they don't always get the services that other kids get. So again, we're here to advocate for that. But I think our presentation today was, you know, the idea was to also highlight that sometimes, even though we've done things a certain way for so long, we need to sometimes always be reevaluating our programs and services to, to keep improving uh, practice for our kids. I agree with, I want to say thank you for that because Cole's, you know, they're, you know, they're all going to the same high school. And I want to think because, um, uh, Cole's doing the same thing here at home. So I know it's, um, different. Like, yeah, I just want to say thank you for that. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank yeah. you so much, Catherine. Great. Are there any more questions? What's the one? Uh, Sarah. I see Sarah. Sarah. Hi. Thank you. I just, <clears throat> sorry. Well, I wanted to thank you for a wonderful presentation. Um, that was great. And and to thank you, too, for addressing the pieces around the inclusivity and, and the language we use um, and things like addressing people as people and, and not, Rebecca, I think you mentioned, you know, not being afraid to just ask questions as opposed to staring. Um, as a parent with uh, someone with a physical disability, I completely understand that. Um, so, yeah, and I think it, it's a long slog ahead to change mindsets or, and I, and I don't think it's, it's comes from a bad place. It's just shifting the way we sort of phrase things and, and how we talk about things. So, but uh, just thank you very much. And uh, I really appreciated the presentation. Thank you so much. I think one of the things that I know my family has done is so Evelyn, I registered Evelyn for junior kindergarten seven years ago. She was not walking. She was in diapers and she was nonverbal. And I just told you she did her grade four speech and is now in the grade five musical. So, again, it's setting those expectations. I knew that she was going to be successful, even though when I presented her to the school, it was like, um, OK, what are we going to do? She had a little walker and she was, you know, they were like, that's OK. We'll clear things out of the classroom so she can maneuver around. And we had her communication book and. Now she's fully verbal, running on the playground, trying to keep up with everybody else. So again, it's setting those expectations, Sarah. As you say, when there's a physical barrier, people very much, they're hesitant, they're scared, they don't know. So what I do every year in September is I print off a double-sided uh, eight and a half by 11, got Evelyn's picture on the front, and I have what she can do in speech, what she can do for fine motor, what she can do for... Uh, gross motor, what, you know, where she's at for reading, where she's at for math. And then on the back, I include that person first language, a little bit about the association, a little bit about um, Down syndrome in general, in the event that the teacher that we get that year doesn't have that. And I present that to the school every year. We only have 170 students in our school. It's a very small school. They know who Evelyn is, but it's important to our family that we set her up for success. And we, we break down those barriers and those those hesitations right from the get-go so that she has the opportunity to be a successful learner and people see her as that successful learner. Um, and that's just a little piece that we've done and I've shared that. I know some other members in our association do that as well because I think it's really important that we advocate for our students, especially when they can't advocate for themselves in the younger years. And, uh, and it certainly has paid off. We've had a very successful um, and positive elementary school experience. And again, I'm grateful that the Halton District School Board has an, such an inclusive policy 
um, and, and talks about the importance of inclusion in our classrooms because it's good for all students. It's not just good for our students with special needs. The things that other students, other peers that Evelyn has gone to school with, uh, the, the things that they have learned and the ways that they have grown is al also remarkable. And we've had parents share those stories with us. So thank you to uh, the board for continuing that work. Uh, it's not always possible, but certainly when it is, uh, it is very important work for teachers, for students, for the communities. So thank you. And actually, so we will wrap up. I know we're, we're, we're a little bit on time, but I did want to say if we could somehow share that resource, the CSS Educator's Guide with, because it's great that we're at these schools and we can advocate, but I do worry about some of the parents, you know, if you're a new immigrant, you're, you're a new Canadian and you don't know, um, sometimes they can't advocate. So I feel like this resource should be in every school. Um, I don't know if it could be shared centrally, Superintendent, or... Um, yeah, thanks, Sophie. That's a great suggestion. We can take that back. <clears throat> Wonderful. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, and at this point in time, we're going to move to uh, action item, which was the first one. And I think we now are able to do the Child First Initiative presentation. So we have a guest speaker uh, talking today um, who's going to explain to us uh, about this Child First Initiative. Thanks so much. Hello, sorry for the delay in coming on. I was having a bit of technical difficulties. <laughs> um, so uh, my name is Faith Jamil and I'm the case manager for the Child First Initiative with Tunga Savonia Inuit. Um, so TI is a social service agency that aims to serve Inuit all over Ontario with their specific needs. Um, we are based in Ottawa, but like I mentioned, uh, we do serve Inuit all over Ontario and we do have a satellite office in Toronto now. So today I'm just going to be presenting the Child First Initiative uh, to you guys, what it is, the ways in which it can benefit the students uh, within your school boards and within your services, um, and about some work I'm doing with other school boards um, in the GTA, um, and just kind of ways that that may translate to uh, your school board as well as the services that you offer to students. I'm going to try to share my screen here, uh, your entire screen, this one here. Bear with me. Can you guys see my presentation? Yep, that's great. Perfect. Okay. Um, so the Child First Initiative is a initiative through Indigenous Service Canada that assures Inuit children have access um, to essential items, services, and supports that they need. Um, so I'm sure many of us are familiar with Jordan's Principle. So CFI is essentially the Anuk version of Jordan's Principle. So Jordan's Principle arose um, and is named in memory of Jordan River Anderson, a young boy from Norway House Cree Nation in Manitoba. Uh, Jordan was born in 1999 with multiple disabilities. Uh, unfortunately, before his untimely death at the age of five, he never had the opportunity to live in a loving home because the federal and provincial government could not come to a consensus as to who was responsible to pay for his at-home care. So in 2016, a Canadian human rights tribunal took place and it was determined that the Canadian government's approach to working with First Nations children was discriminatory, hence where Jordan's principle was born out of. Unfortunately, this human rights tribunal did not include Inuit. Um, however, it is acknowledged by various Inuit social service agencies and land claim organization that if Inuit were to bring the federal government to uh, a human rights tribunal, that it will likely have the same result. So because of this, the federal government chose to create CFI to address the needs of Inuit children based on the fact that they were being rejected from Jordan's principle uh, because of their race. So there are a couple differences between CFI and between Jordan's principle. Uh, the two main ones being that there is no 48 hour response time and any appeals in the process are not heard by an impartial third party and an appeals process also does not include uh, community members to help come to these decisions. So the main goal of a CFI application is to assure that substantive equality is being met. Um, so substantive equality is a term that is utilized within human rights law, and it basically refers to equity versus equality. Um, it is a way to assure that no matter a person's sociopolitical situation, race, gender, sexual orientation, um, that these things do not act as a barrier to them accessing 
uh, services. So substantial equality is both a process and an end result. So by doing a CFI application, we are in the process of assuring substantial equality. And if we are successful in obtaining funding, then substantial equality is being met. So all Inuit children, no matter where they live in Canada, can request funding through the Child First Initiative. Indigenous Service Canada breaks the country up um, into provincial territories, except for the North and for the Maritimes. Those are their own um, sectors. And so TI um, is designated as one of the agencies that support Inuit in completing these applications. We also do support uh, Inuit who live outside of Ontario. However, this is only in very specific circumstances. And so currently, we're trying to build uh, relationships with uh, school boards as well as service providers, providers pardon me, <laughs> who work with uh, Inuk students on a daily basis. We believe that in the spirit of reconciliation, knowledge is power, and that by putting the knowledge into the hands of those that work face-to-face -face with our community members on a daily basis, that this uh, initiative will have the potential to support um, many more children in a much more uh, diverse and substantial way. So within the CFI application process, it very much is a client-led process. So with that being said, we very much need the buy-in of the family in order to do it. Um, I can talk until I'm blue, into the, blue in the face of the family about uh, getting support letters together and documentation, but until that family is willing to uh, kind of meet us and do the work with us and be a part of that process, we really won't be uh, successful in something. So the parent or the guardian or the youth over the age of 16 would be seen as the first role in this process. The second person would be the CFI coordinator or the case manager, which is what I do. So um, what part of my role is to meet with families when we are initially approached by them, get a better understanding of the family's history, help them kind of determine what is the best wraparound service, as well as supporting them with completing the application. Um, the application can be a bit paperwork heavy, and so this can be very overwhelming for families sometimes. And so if a family just wants our advice on who to ask or if they want us to ask the person directly, um, we meet the family where they're at and really tailor our support to what their needs are. And then the last person is the CFI service coordinator. And so this person, uh, their main role is to oversee direct services, which is a really cool part of our program that I'll touch on a bit later. Um, and essentially they are supposed to kind of create and maintain a roster of service providers that we have deemed to be culturally competent and culturally safe for our community members to utilize. Um, if we are approached with a service provider that we don't know, we can offer some cultural competency screening to the family if that's what they wish. Unfortunately, with all this being said, um, it is not the opinion of the federal government that a CFI application should uh, support the family unit as a whole, only the child. Um, however, departments like my own, as well as other Inuit social service agencies recognize that supporting a child inadvertently supports the family. And so we need to be very conscious of that when doing our applications and making sure that it is very much a child first uh, wording in the application. So requests can be submitted by a parent or a guardian of the dependent child, um, a youth over the age of 16 that would like to advocate for themselves, or an authorized representative of the child or the parents or guardian. Um, so in this situation, TI would be recognized as an authorized representative as we do get written consent from the family to submit on behalf and speak with Indigenous Service Canada. Uh, the child also needs to be uh, recognized by a land claim region or is eligible for recognition through a parent. So we can prove this by either accepting their N number, which uh, is their non-insured health benefits number, or their beneficiary card number. Um, with Inuvia Louis and uh, Nunavut, they have a card, whereas with Nunavik and Labrador, they have a land claim organization letter. So something of that nature, whether it's from the child or the uh, parent, we can utilize that. If the child also does have First Nation status, they can apply to Jordan's principal instead of CFI. However, uh, we would not help with that. We would redirect the family to an organization that could help them with a JP uh, uh, application because we only work with Inuit. 
So a really beautiful part of this program is that um, we can apply for just about anything. Uh, we like to say that they fall under these three categories, health, social, cultural, and educational. Um, but in reality, if you can think of it, I can think of a way to spin it to Indigenous Service Canada to give us the funding. Um, so as long as we can provide the adequate paperwork uh, and the justifications as for why we need to obtain this funding, um, like I said, the, the sky is the limit, really. Um, we were recently successful in obtaining funding to uh, fund a, the salary of an educational assistant for a child that needed additional support in the classroom. We funded things like hockey camps and dance lessons, uh, equestrian therapy, um, furniture for children whose families are coming out of homelessness. Uh, laptops for students for educational purposes. So it's really and truly anything that you guys can think of, we can try to make it work. So on the screen before you, you'll just see a few more examples of uh, things that we've been able to help provide support for. Um, it really is a case by case basis. And when we are doing these applications, we try to assure that uh, a wraparound service is being provided. So. Um, what we mean by that is that if a child is applying for, or if a family rather, is applying for a hockey camp, um, the family may not think of the cost of the hockey equipment, hockey tournaments, the transportation to and from practices. And so we can kind of guide the family to say, hey, let's not just apply for the tuition of top hockey, but also for uh, the mileage and everything, you know, so that their child accessing whatever it is they're accessing does not come at an additional financial burden of the family. So as I previously mentioned, uh, a CFI application does require a couple pieces of documents. The first two being uh, letters of support, ideally from a licensed professional that works one-on-one -on -one with a child. Um, so this could be a doctor, social worker, occupational therapist, a teacher, an EA, a principal, um, anybody really that sees the child on a regular basis um, and is licensed, uh, CFI considers these letters um, the most weighted in an application. We like to think that letters from teachers are kind of gold for an application because they are the person that sees that child the most regularly outside of their family unit. Um, we have a minimum amount of support letters, but we don't have a maximum, which is really great. So we can also get letters from the parents, uh, from other family members, community members, cultural leaders, um, or if the child themselves wants to write something on to advocate for themselves, we encourage as many possible support letters as we can get, um, because in our experience, that means that a application is more likely to be successful. We also need to provide a quote or a budget, so just something essentially outlining um, all of the associated costs. Uh, if we're asking for something like material items, we would talk with the family about what specific items it is that they're wanting and then kind of get an average idea of what that cost is and just put it into a spreadsheet to send to Indigenous Service Canada. And the last one being a letter of substantial equality. So this is one of the main roles of the coordinator and the case manager with the CFI team. Um, so with the interactions that we have with the family and kind of gathering this history with the family and understanding their needs a bit more, we put a letter that kind of details all of this information and kind of links it back to how uh, the historical treatment of the Canadian government towards Inuit um, has kind of led them to be at the point that they are today and how obtaining this funding would help uh, mitigate any potential future uh, trauma and set these children up for success, whatever it may be. So in an ideal world, uh, we would have the following time frame for a CFI application. So within two days of submitting, we would get some sort of receipt from Indigenous Service Canada that they've received the application. Within a week, we would get a case number. And within a three week period, we would have some sort of answer as to if the application is being proved or not, or if there's additional documentation that is being um, required. Unfortunately, we're working with the federal government here, and this is seldomly the case. Uh, so lately, we've been finding that we're getting the case numbers relatively immediately, but we are having to wait upwards two months to hear back from applications. So with this being said, when we do meet with the families and service providers who may be referring families to our program, we really try to create a realistic expectation of this is not going to be an overnight process, that this is going to take a while. And we also ask people to bear this in mind to be proactive with the applications so that, um, for example, if we're applying for uh, winter clothing, a child is not going without the necessary clothing for a duration of time because we're waiting for that response from Indigenous Service Canada.
So group applications are essentially an application that supports more than one uh, enough child. It wouldn't, this a group application wouldn't be like one family unit. It would be more so like a diverse group of uh, enough children, like a classroom or something. So on your screen, you guys will see a couple different examples of uh, group uh, applications that were successful in supporting uh, Inuit children. Um, we've also seen things like wheelchair ramps or specialized programming for Inuit children to have uh, some cultural education. Um, so currently I'm working with a couple different school boards in the GTA, uh, Toronto District School Board, some co-Catholic school board, uh, York Regional District School Board, and a couple other ones. Um, and we're coming together and we're trying to create some sort of programming for Inuit children within the GTA so that they have access to cultural education. Um, this is very much in its preliminary stages. We're still meeting uh, with the school boards and we're going to be surveying families shortly. Um, but a, a program of this nature has the potential to be funded by um, a group application. So direct services is a program or a part of our program that is kind of unique to TI. Um, and so with this, without needing a official CFI application, we're able to approve up to 30 hours of speech language pathology, respite services and tutoring. And we can approve a psychoeducational assessment every two years. Um, and so what this does is that it allows us to give uh, these children the opportunity to access these services that it is incredibly time sensitive typically that these children access these services. Um, if it is recognized that the child would need support beyond what we are able to allot them, we would start them in this part of the process. And then while they're utilizing that 30 hours, we would complete a proper CFI application to get the extended coverage. Um, and so essentially it's like if a family member was paying for your child's tutoring um, instead of yourself, we, give the advice on the family of where they could potentially go, offer the cultural competency screening. Um, and then once the family takes that initiative to make the appointment with the service provider, then we would just ask for the billing information and we just pay the billing information. So we're not really acting as a middleman, we're just more so acting as the financial support and the families are kind of at the head of um, that intervention and support with their child. Um, I would like to note, however, that just because we have relationship with service providers doesn't mean we are able to expedite waitlists. Um, I know in Ottawa, the waitlist to get a psychoeducational assessment virtually anywhere is incredibly long right now. And unfortunately, we don't have the ability to kind of speed that up for our community members. So we do have a referral process in place. Um, on the screen that you see before you, childfirst at tiontario.ca, you guys can send an email to that inbox. Um, it's monitored by our entire team. And uh, regardless of what ebbs and flows we have in terms of people in certain positions, um, this uh, email address remains with the program, so it will always be answered by someone. We also have a referral form that uh, can be completed, and so I can send that um, afterwards to you all so that you have a digital version of it. We also do have a digital pamphlet that I can send out, and it just summarizes everything that I've touched on today um, and kind of puts uh, what I'm saying to paper so that uh, no information is being missed and that you guys can also please feel free to share with your networks. We really do want to make as many connect connections with as many different people that we can in Ontario uh, because we really do want to utilize this program to its fullest potential. Nakovni, thank you. Great, thank you so much. It's very informative. Um, <laughs> does anybody have any questions? I know I do. Um, <laughs> I, I was just interested to know as, um, you know, we're obviously in Halton and Hamilton. Yeah. Um, how many members of the Inuit community are in our region that, that this might support? So I wouldn't have that information, however, uh, I think it would be a safe assumption to, that the Indigenous uh, educational, um, uh, like the, well, what's the word, like the in Indigenous educational department within your school board uh, would likely have the numbers on the self-identifying uh, Inuit children within your school board. With that being said, it also is important to recognize that a lot of Inuit families choose to not self-identify for various reasons. Um, but what I am personally noticing is that there are a growing number of Inuit within um, your region as well as the GTA and kind of more southern Ontario um, because of the growing um, 
uh, living expenses within Ottawa and Toronto. And so uh, moving out to kind of these less densely populated areas uh, is a bit more affordable. Um, but I wouldn't have exact numbers on that, unfortunately. Okay. And apparently David does, does have some information. I don't have exact numbers either, but I'd like to introduce um, our assistant principal for Indigenous Rights and okay. in Education, Gabriella Echeverria, who's on the line. I don't, Faith, I don't know if you've met Gabby yet. Yes, um, she, well, we've talked. <laughs> she is on the line tonight as well. So if there are questions specific to the Halton District School Board, and Gabby may not have exact information either, but she can certainly provide uh, some of that uh, information, I think. Gabby, are you out there? Yeah, thank you so much, David, for the introduction, and thank you, Faith, for the presentation. Uh, super excited because it's certainly a need. Um, and thank you, Catherine, for your question. It's a great question, um, and um, like Faith described, uh, it's tricky to respond to for a number of reasons. Uh, number one is really the, the major reason is uh, to ensure confidentiality, but we can assure you that we do have students who identify as Inuk in our system, and we would greatly benefit from the um, resources that are available for Inuk children in Ontario. So I thank you, Faith, for sharing that. I look forward to seeing your pamphlet and uh, also um, connecting in the future. Uh, I, I think we can connect immediately. Yeah, of <laughs> we can think of, uh, of ways to um, use your resources. So I thank you. And it's really nice to meet everyone. Um, like David had said, uh, I'm in the role of Assistant Principal for Indigenous Rights and Education with the Halton District School Board. I look forward to um, perhaps returning um, at a meeting sometime to be able to also talk about uh, what our department does. Thanks for the time. Great, thank you. Does anybody else have any questions? I have my hand up. <laughs> oh, sorry, I can't see. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. Catherine. Uh, yes, yeah, so um, my questions are really around outreach and in particular outreach in non-traditional territories versus traditional territories because it sounds like the program is much better established in traditional territories and you're just recently trying to improve outreach in non-traditional territories in GTA and um, sort of other areas is that what's the timeline difference do you think of uh, between the way that you have approached traditional territories in the north versus your outreach right now it sounds it's pretty fresh. So this program CFI as a, a program within the federal government has existed since I want to say 2017. Um, so it has been around for a long time. Within uh, Tongas Pointe Inuit specifically, we have had our program to support Inuit living in urban spaces for about three years now. Um, and so an unfortunate part of the program is that it does follow uh, the federal um, elections. And so there is always the potential for uh, it to be mixed. Um, in terms of outreach, Part of the reason I've been reaching out to SEAC committees is because we are noticing that um, this program is not being utilized as much in urban spaces um, as it is in the north. Um, and that's just because the information isn't really um, shared very widely. And so um, instead of waiting for the federal government to take the initiative and share it, we just thought it would be best if we reach out to school boards um, and share this information so that we can try to reach as many uh, kids. Because TI is very well known within Ottawa, but Unfortunately, yeah. outside of Ottawa, we don't um, have the same reach. So our hope is that kind of putting the bug in everybody's ears will kind of help spread awareness. And um, beyond my program, we have a ton of different services that we can offer at TI. And so if any of you have an enough family seeking support, even if my program may not be the right program to offer support, the chances are I could redirect towards a program that would be able to offer that support. Right. So is your primary outreach it sounds like it's primarily school boards. Like what? There, so you've got service providers, school boards. Uh, is there direct parent outreach? Like where where are you focusing your outreach in? Again, in a sort of as you're trying to expand knowledge of your programs mm -hmm. in places that don't are that don't have that awareness. Are you doing direct parent outreach? Are you? Is it mainly the school boards? Is it mainly the service providers? So. Uh, the service providers and school boards definitely are uh, the big ones, but um, we are currently running radio campaigns in more rural parts of Ontario with the hopes that families themselves will hear it. And we have been seeing some results, um, like some uh, responses as a result of that. 
Um, we also are quite active on social media. We uh, recognize that Inuit tend to really utilize Facebook to kind of spread awareness and messages. And so um, our Facebook page is uh, relatively active. Um, and then as well, the uh, Toronto office, I believe that they are kind of starting to make their footprint a little bit known so that um, families within the GTA know us a little bit more um, and are able to kind of access our services. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> It did. Thank you. You yeah. actually answered the majority of my questions in the last couple of minutes of your talk. So, <laughs> perfect. Okay. And if you have any other questions, please feel free to reach out. I'm I'm happy to answer whatever it is. <laughs> Great. Well, I really want to thank you for coming. It sounds as if there's some great connections being built there um, that can be uh, explored within the school board. Um, anything that we can do to support um, any members of our uh, school system that have specific needs is always um, high on the priority list. So thank you for coming to speak to us this evening and making us aware of this fantastic program. Great. Thank you guys so much for your time. Take care. Take care then. Bye. Bye. -bye. Okay, wow, we've learned a lot already tonight, and uh, we're about to head into a whole lot more knowledge. Um, it's a heavy night tonight. Um, we have next um, our budget overview pre presentation. Roxana Nagoy, Superintendent of Business Services, is going to be leading us on the first of our sessions related to the budget. So this is going to be an overview of how the financial system uh, related to special education in the school board takes place and, and the government funding. And uh, once we have a better understanding of that, uh, Roxana will come back again with the budget to explain how that all fell out and um, how the board intends to use the money that uh, has been found. So um, Roxana, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Well, thank you, and uh, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to uh, see you, even though it's still virtual today. Uh, a lot of uh, familiar faces and a couple of new faces as well. I just wanted to uh, mention uh, I do have with me tonight uh, our controller of financial services, Jay Chantavong, and the manager of budget, Vanessa Frias. So they are also on the line uh, and uh, will... Uh, uh, team up as we go through these slides. I'm going to be presenting, and uh, as soon as I, I put it as a, in presentation mode, I'm not going to be able to see you. Uh, so please, if uh, you have questions as we go through this, uh, let me know, interrupt me, and, and we'll pause, uh, as I won't be able to see hands up uh, on the screen. Um, and uh, just... Uh, um, one other thing to mention in terms of presentation. So this is the very first presentation is just an, uh, more of an orientation into the budget process and to give you a, a snapshot as to where we are in this current year. Um, more so than where we're going into next, uh, current, next year because we don't yet have a lot of the information. We will be coming back, uh, uh hopefully for the meeting, uh, on, uh, May the 2nd with more information once the, the funding is released. And that is where, as an advisory committee, you would have more uh, information to be able to provide some input into the budget process. So with that, I'm just going to uh, put it in the presentation. And I will walk you through uh, some of the slides and then I'll pass it on to uh, my team. Uh, so today we'll uh, just go over the budget process overall. I'll give you a little bit of information uh, in terms of what we know from a provincial perspective, where we are from a board perspective, and then I will pass it on to Jay and Vanessa to walk you through uh, the key budget components, looking a little bit more into the special education components, and then uh, we'll wrap it up with what are some of the next steps for planning for next year. The budget development uh, process uh, has very uh, um, specific requirements and the objectives are strictly aligned with the multi-year plan and the five strategic priorities. Uh, it uh, supports the annual operation plan that uh, uh, actions all the uh, strategic priorities uh, as well as the special education plan. Uh, they all go hand in hand and they are approved together in June. 
So you'll notice in uh, the June board agenda meetings that uh, the annual operating plan, special education plan budget, as well as the corp- the um, capital uh, budget uh, and plan, capital plan, are all approved at the same time and they are connected and aligned with each other. In addition, we take into account what are the key risks that uh, impact our ability to reach our strategic goals, and we call that our corporate risk profile, uh, and we keep those in mind uh, and try to mitigate as we are allocating resources. Uh, we certainly have a number of accountability uh, measures and regulatory compliance that we have to keep in mind when we develop the budget, uh, such as uh, enveloping provisions. Uh, for example, the special education allocation has to be spent on special education programs, uh, as well as having a balanced budget or a compliant budget as we put forward. So we have to take into account the funding that we receive in a year, uh, and uh, manage the expenses uh, for the school district overall within that funding allocation every year. So in terms of the budget development timelines, uh, we do start early uh, in November, and it goes all the way until June. And this all happens in the fiscal year that is prior to the year that we're, we're planning for. So currently, uh, we have completed the, the provincial funding consultations, uh, a number of uh, budget planning sessions around the senior uh, team, uh, as well as uh, the stakeholder consultation. So the um, survey has closed uh, yesterday, uh, and we are uh, currently continuing with um, our uh, budget sessions with the budget holders and developing the salary budget as well as the operating budget. As we move into May and June, once we get the actual grants for student needs and we know more in terms of the direction from the ministry, the methods of learning, additional supports provided or not provided, we are able to actually develop a draft budget and bring it back to uh, the board. Uh, We are uh, expecting that will be later in May um, to have a a fully draft budget, but we'll uh, aim to present uh, at SEAC at your main meeting, which is at the beginning of May. And finally, the board approves uh, the budget by the end of June. That is in the Education Act. So key dates in terms of the budget process from now until June, uh, we've just listed them here. So you have them for your reference and we'll be sharing this. I believe Lorna will share with the committee the uh, presentation after uh, the meeting. Uh, tomorrow we have a budget planning presentation at the Committee of the Whole with the Board of Trustees. We are uh, looking at another presentation in April uh, and a board report on stakeholder consultation on April 19th. Uh, so after that, we're, we're going into the SIAC presentation and the draft budget presentation later in May. So as we are developing the budget, we have a number of points and feedback, uh, not just from our staff and our departments and budget owners within uh, internal stakeholders, so uh, within the board, but also external stakeholders. Every year we launch a budget uh, survey. And uh, uh, this current year, it uh, just closed actually on May 6th. So we're looking at pulling the responses and providing a a report to be assessed uh, as we're looking at uh, initiatives. We're looking at um, challenges for next year uh, and bring it back to the Board of Trustees on April, um, April 19th. Uh, We also uh, use uh, tomorrow's session with the trustees as uh, an input, early input into the budget process, although throughout the course of the next few months, we meet with the trustees and uh, they have the opportunity to see different components of the budget and have uh, uh, their uh, input as we uh, continue to develop uh, the budget process. I've already mentioned that we'll see you again in May. Uh, and um, finally, we, we take all that input and we look through uh, the available funding, uh, reallocation of funding, additional funding in order to come up with uh, what we are able to uh, prioritize and offer from 
um, current year into next year, as well as any additional resources or resources that need to be reallocated towards uh, different areas of priority that may may uh, uh, raise uh, depending on the environment. Um, so with regards to uh, the budget, we are um, looking at uh, receiving our grants for student needs, which makes uh, most of our funding. It all starts with the ministry's consultation back in the fall. So it was uh, this year was released in October with uh, responses provided in uh, November and early December to the ministry. And um, that input is being taken by the Treasury Board provincially, and it forms uh, their basis for the education sector funding uh, as they develop the provincial budget. Uh, as I understand, the um, province is set to table their their budget on March 23rd. So we're hoping soon after that, the grants for student needs will also be released. Funding is based mostly on enrollment. And uh, we submit in November the enrollment projections for the following year to the ministry, which form the basis and most of the funding around uh, the projections that get released in March will be based on this projection uh, and the enrollment that we have submitted back in November. Of course, uh, as we um, get more information and updated information, when we build a budget, our enrollment will be more up to date and may differ from what was submitted in November. And uh, as a little bit of background for uh, any new members, we do have three uh, financial reporting cycles that we are uh, required to report to the ministry. So we're currently speaking about the budget uh, estimates or the, the budget process, which is developed three months before the beginning of the fiscal year. The fiscal year is the same as the school year. So it runs from September 1st to August 31st. Uh, at this point in time, it is based on projected enrollment. So we have two count dates, count dates for enrollment. Uh, October 31st and March 31st. So both of those uh, dates are projected because right now we don't know uh, what October 31st, 2023 enrollment will be or March 31st, 2024. So we are using the current enrollment uh, and then we're projecting uh, what the growth or the decline is based on uh, uh, municipality and at the school level uh, for those two dates. Trustees are required to approve the budget by the end of June. Uh, trustees are required to approve a balanced budget, which means the revenues equal the um, expenses in year. However, there's a provision for a compliant budget, which means we can use reserves for a school board that does have reserves uh, of up to 1% of our provincial allocation. In our case, that means we can have a deficit budget of approximately 7.5 million uh, and we do that on purpose. At times, we go into our reserves and we have a deficit budget uh, intentionally as we are allocating funds towards the multi-year plan priorities in order to support uh, the strategic priorities. Revised budget is developed three months after the beginning of the year. So once we have the actual enrollment for October 31st count date, and then we project March 31st, but we now have a much better base to know where we're going to uh, end up in terms of enrollment. Uh, it's presented to the Board of Trustees on December 15th. If the budget is higher or the deficit is higher than what was approved in June, then it comes forward as an approval budget, as an approval item. And finally, the audited financial statements are based on the actual enrollment for both candidates, the actual um, financial position at the end of the year, and is approved by the Board of Trustees on November 15th of every year. From a provincial perspective, um, education is the second largest component of the provincial budget. And for the current year, that was $26.1 billion. Uh, there were additional funding that was provided in terms of um, post-pandemic supports that we're focusing on student learning and um, learning recovery 
um, mental health, special education, ventilation, um, and um, as well as a, a one-year extension for supports for student funds, which uh, is a timely investment that is uh, tied to collective agreements and provides us with uh, staffing across all employee groups. Um, the consultation uh, on education funding uh, back in the fall focused on reducing administrative burden, uh, the time to complete major capital projects, which is important for school boards such as ours, that is a growth school board, uh, and uh, the opportunity for joint use of schools, uh, which is uh, more appropriate for school boards that uh, don't qualify for a full-size school, but would be joining with coterminous boards in order to have some um, shared facilities such as the gym, library, etc. From uh, the focus that was in the consultation, uh, we are reading between the lines that there, uh, that we would expect the grants for student needs to be similar to the current year, no major changes. Although we do know there's a provincial um, transportation uh, working committee that uh, has been looking at that allocation uh, and that in particular will change. So some school boards um, may be over time uh, losing funds and some school board may be gaining funds. So we don't know exactly where that will go. But other than that, we are expecting similar grants for student needs. Uh, having said that, we do have significant one-time funding that we don't know whether or not it will continue at this point in time. The labor negotiations are continuing. We only have two ratified agreements, so there's much more to come on this front. However, a lot of the things that are being centrally negotiated, do if they have funding implication, uh, the expectation is that they do come fully funded. So we're continuing to monitor the labor negotiations front. Um, I mentioned already the grant, the provincial budget is stable for uh, March 23rd, uh, which we expect the grants for student needs uh, to be uh, following uh, soon after that. Um, I think I've covered already most of these things. Uh, I'll just mention a couple of them. Uh, on a provincial level, the funding usually provides a component for inflation or cost escalation. It's typically been around 2%. Uh, as we've seen in the last uh, year and a bit, uh, inflation has significantly increased. The supply chain um, challenges have also caused cost escalation. And we've seen increases in some of our um, uh, contractual services, um, bills, utilities that have significantly increased 7 to 10%. So we, the grants are not keeping up with the provincial cost escalation that we've seen in the last year and a half. So that's one of the concerns that we're uh, looking to see where the grants will land for next year and whether or not it will catch up to some of that inflation um, impact. Uh, and also, um, we are uh, not sure when capital priorities will be provided, which is the funding that provides us with a uh, new school, um, with a provision to, to build new schools. And in our cases, North Oakville and South Milton continue to grow, and we just simply cannot build schools fast enough for when those uh, uh, developments are coming online. So looking from a board perspective, uh, what does that mean for us? Um, we are, uh, as from an enrollment perspective, we're expecting a slight decline at the elementary panel uh, and uh, an increase in a, a secondary panel. So overall, we're still in a growth position, not quite the same growth that we've seen prior to the pandemic, but we are starting to see the growth come back. Uh, whereas during the pandemic, uh, a lot of families either moved away from uh, our region, uh, immigration and um, uh, international students uh, have uh, been reduced. And all of those factors have really impacted our growth um, uh, within the Halton region. So we're starting to see that uh, slightly come back to normal levels. Um, we've seen a bit of an uptick in international students. And um, that uh, continues to, to grow. 
Uh, there is a recovery in our facility rentals, uh, interest expense and school generated funds. So these areas of revenues have seen significant declines and we, um, we use, uh, in particular, uh, facility rentals, interest expense. Those are miscellaneous revenues that help us balance the budget. It helps, help us uh, cover for resources in other areas, such as programming and special education. So it's very important that uh, we're seeing the recovery in these uh, sources of revenue. Um, we are uh, currently um, looking at the completion of one more uh, Milton uh, Elementary School, Milton number 12. Uh, planning for Milton number 13th, but that won't be completed for, for next year. Uh, and planning for uh, one in North Oakville, uh, as well as a secondary school in North Oakville. So lots of new schools that are uh, in the works, as you can see, uh, to, to be able to capture the enrollment growth. Um, we do have significant concerns about addressing post-pandemic uh, gaps. Uh, with the current funding level, given the significant amount of one-time funding uh, that is set to expire. So I think the next, here we go, the, the next slide gives it a little bit of proportion. So we have uh, a few uh, areas of one-time funding that are set to expire. The first one is the student funds, the, the support for student funds, or we call it SSF. Uh, that is tied to collective agreements for our board is 6.1 million. Um, out of all these numbers that make up the 6.1 million, uh, we are uh, the caretakers or um, our QP staff have uh, ratified their collective agreements and have uh, negotiated for this to return. But we are not sure about the rest of those, um, the funding for the rest of the employee groups that are listed uh, there. So uh, we, we certainly are concerned whether or not there will be um, an intention from the ministry to provide another one-time year extension uh, to boards as the negotiations continue, or will this expire until such time that there are um, ratified agreements? And I think I've heard a hand go up. Uh, yes, uh, Catherine, would you, you ask did. a question? Um, yes, uh, specifically around um, support staff headcount and the COVID-19 funding. Um, what is the likely impact in terms of uh, workers like social workers in the secondary schools and elementary schools if something like the mental health support line in COVID-19 gets removed? Like what are we what are we looking at in terms of impact in the schools? So we, we are uh, certainly um, have provided the next slide. I guess I'll, I'll flip between the two just as I, I respond to that. Um, this is a slide that provides the impact of losing all those sources of funding, whether it's the support for student funds, the COVID um, learning recovery fund, uh, the tutoring funds, et cetera, or the money that we're putting through reserves uh, in terms of one-time investments into the, the budget. So we certainly are uh, looking at the significant number of, you'll see educational assistant, assistants, uh, child and youth counselors, um, for free social workers, uh, speech language pathologists, uh, to, um, there are some special education teachers uh, in both panels as well that have uh, one of these sources of funding attached. Um, this is not to say we're losing all these uh, resources. It's just to show how many resources have been uh, funded over the last few years, uh, two to three years, from these sources of funding that have been um, renewed year after year uh, during the pandemic, but it's always one year at a time and we just don't know uh, whether or not uh, these are returning. Uh, one concern is, uh, I believe, in the uh, public statement around releasing the, the provincial budget, uh, one of the things that uh, was mentioned is that um, the province's spending and large deficits that uh, they had during the pandemic have run their course and that it's time for restraint. Um, so that 
is, um, I, I'm not sure how to interpret that, but that uh, worries me a little bit as I'm looking at the COVID learning um, um, renewal funding that is provided, uh, those 85.6 positions. I'm not sure whether or not uh, that will still be uh, a priority from a provincial budget perspective. And that is significant money. So if I go back to the previous slide, uh, and we're looking at the COVID funding, you'll see there's almost 15 million, um, just shy of 15 million that is provided in that COVID uh, recovery type of fund. Um, we knew that is one-time funding. Uh, we knew the additional supports was to help with, um, you know, two models of learning, um, significant, uh, more significant absenteeism in terms of um, you know, the, the requirement to self, um, um, uh, isolate, et cetera. So things that where we, we had more, um, um, replacement of staff that we needed. So that, that's sort of where, um, that funding, uh, was provided. Uh, we also have about 7.5 million from surplus that we've dedicated on purpose. Uh, to assist. And every year we look at the portion of our surplus to continue to support our initiatives. So that some of that will happen. We cannot afford to have 7.5 million every year. We will deplete our um, reserves very quickly. So we, we've done uh, some uh, additional uh, support through the pandemic, uh, but going forward, certainly it cannot be quite as high. So um, this is just uh looking at all the fun, the, the, the um, positions that are funded one time. And these positions are in our uh, uh, lo long-term occasional type of position. So they're not permanent positions within our system. Since we've seen uh, a couple of ratified agreements uh, receiving the students, the support for student funding, I would like to, uh, I would hope that we could see that first column of funding coming back. Um, we've also heard the minister mention that literacy, numeracy, um, and uh, um, learning recovery has continued to be a priority. So I'm hoping that the, the tutoring funding, which has uh, a, also a, a significant component for special education supports, uh, will also return, and that helps with most of the PPF column in here. Um, it really is the COVID column that provides the most concern for, based on our current information. I'm not sure if there's any more questions uh, about these slides. Um, Otherwise, I will move on. I don't okay. know there are at this time. Yeah. All right. Thank you. So we'll move on uh, in just to provide you a little bit of uh, an overview of the key budget components uh, enrollment, which makes uh, is the basis for our grants, uh, a breakdown of revenues and expenses. And we'll look at the, the board overall and then specifically for special education. And that, that would be for the current year. So just keep that in mind. We don't have the numbers for next year. From an enrollment perspective, we are looking at the two count dates for October 31st and March 31st. So it's the average daily enrollment. Uh, and uh, that forms most of our grants for student needs. However, uh, the many allocations within the grant are also based on other demographic and socioeconomic factors, statistical factors, census, birth rates, migration, etc. So there's many factors that are built in uh, the education funding formula, uh, enrollment being possibly the biggest. Um, the square footage of our schools is another big one as well. Uh, and when we look at the enrollment, the next couple of slides, uh, you will see um, how we went from growth. So 2019, 2020 and earlier, we were looking at 800 to 1,000 students growth year after year. Then 2020, 2021 came in with the pandemic and there is a decrease. 
in enrollment. Uh, and from there, we started to pick up about 798 students in the year after the pandemic, and then uh, 550 uh, seven students more in the current year. And, um, oh, sorry, actually that's the budget. When, when we got better enrollment in October 31st, we're looking at about 857 growth over the prior year. So that growth is starting to come back into the seven and 800. Um, and looking at the projection for next year based on our current uh, best numbers, uh, we are looking at an overall uh, growth of 635 over the current uh, revised estimates, our revised budget, uh, with, a, as I mentioned, a, a slight decrease in elementary and an increase in secondary. The main f reason for that is we have a large grade 8 moving into the secondary panel, uh, followed by smaller kindergarten grades, entry-level grades coming in. Uh, Roxana, we have a question from Mel. Melissa. No worries. Good evening. Um, just to get a better understanding when it comes to the budgets and how the allocation increases and decreases, is that money specifically based on like the provincial amounts that increase or decrease, or is that board specific when those increases when the funding fluctuates? That's a, a great question. Uh, it actually is both. Um, so it depends on our enrollment. Most of the, including the special education allocation, is based on the overall enrollment base. So if our enrollment is declining, so will our overall uh, uh, grant. Uh, it is also based on changes that are made within the allocation on a provincial level. So if the ministry, for example, decides to change how they, they allocate funding to one particular area, such as special education or transportation, which will change. And they put in different factors. Uh, they could reduce it overall. So all school boards will lose funding or it could fluctuate based on some other um, uh, qualifier, depending on uh, maybe a statistical uh, um, uh, identifier or socioeconomic factors, or they update the census data. And if we show higher trends or lower trends, that will impact board by board as well. So it could be both. The biggest risk for us in terms of uh, funding uh, decrease is losing the one-time funding. All the boards around the province are in the same position. Depending on their size, they all have about a proportion of that funding uh, more or less than what we would have, depending on how big or s small they are. Um, but we're all in the same position where we are. Uh, we have significant staffing associated with one-time funds. Um, so just the enrollment trends, as you've seen, we've always been a, a board that has been going up with the exception of 2021. We took a bit of a dip. And then slowly we're, we're building that uh, enrollment back up. Um, and we'll get in a little bit more into the revenues uh, and, and might answer a little bit more Mel's question. I will pass it on to Jay at this point. Um, I'm just going to, actually, that's okay. I'll, I'll pass it on to Jay uh, and uh, maybe he can give me the cue when to uh, switch the slides. All right, uh, thanks Roxana and uh, good evening everybody. Um, so I'll be uh, going over our revenues, um, transitioning um, directly from uh, enrollment, which drives a lot of it. And then uh, following me, uh, Vanessa will go over um, uh, expenses, uh, including um, special education uh, expenses uh, in particular. Um, so to start off here, uh, we have a, a pie uh, graph of uh, showing a breakdown of our revenue or total revenue by um, source or allocation. Um, as you can see, the large blue one makes up uh, nearly 89% of our overall funding, which would be the provincial grants, uh, uh, grants for student needs. So GSM for short is what we'll um, refer to it as. Um, and then the other allocations that are um, uh, make up the rest are, are things like um, deferred capital contribution, 
uh, school generated funds and uh, other fees and revenues. Um, so the next slide will um, lay it out more, uh, more in a list format with a little more um, uh, detail. Um, so it's organized uh, in terms of uh, ministry funding, uh, school generated funds, and then other. Um, so ministry funding, as I mentioned, uh, the GSM makes up nearly 89%, uh, and then another uh, almost 1% is our uh, provincial gas other, um, or PPFs for short, uh, priorities of partnership funds. So those are um, kind of like one-time funding for a specific uh, initiative or, or project. Uh, so between the two, we're, we're talking nearly 90% of our funding is um, from the ministry. Uh, and then, uh, as Roxanne mentioned before, uh, we're heavily... Um, uh, funded uh, based on enrollment, uh, as well as other um, factors such as social demographic, uh, number of schools, size of our schools, and underground uh, capacity. Um, school generated funds uh, is uh, exactly what um, the, the term implies. It, it's the funds raised at the school level um, and spent at the school level. Um, other revenues of 8.3%, uh, uh, as I mentioned, um, uh, deferred capital contributions uh, to offset our amortization expenses. Uh, so the amortization of our buildings, our equipment, um, and so forth. Um, and the other uh, large chunk there is uh, other fees and revenues, which is mainly made up of uh, uh, tuition fees uh, for international students and uh, rental income for the use of our facilities. Um, and also in there is uh, education development charges, which I'll touch on later. Um, so moving on, um, the next few slides break down the uh, GSN um, and kind of outline the, the main um, allocations within it and what they support. Um, so the first uh, one here, uh, and also the largest, is um, the People Foundation Grant. So what this does is um, support essentially all the resources within the, within the classrooms and uh, resources that support schools. Uh, the, the largest ones being uh, classroom teachers, supply teachers, uh, early childhood educators, um, some um, educational assistants, uh, classroom uh, supplies and learning materials and so forth. Um, so then on the next slide, um, another allocation that supports the, uh, the school itself is the school foundation uh, grant. So that essentially... Um, funds the uh, school administration staff, uh, being the uh, principals, vice principals, and uh, office staff, as well as any um, uh, supplies. Um, and then the supplemental grants. So there's a number of uh, allocations, allocations that fall under here that uh, support programming, uh, special education, of course, um, school maintenance, transportation, and so forth. So the special education grant there that's bolded um, will... will um, uh, get into that in a little bit more detail in the following slides. Um, so then this next slide is just uh, continuing on uh, the list of supplemental grants, um, some of the larger ones being the cost adjustments, uh, teacher qualification. So that's essentially a top up um, to fund uh, the teachers that are higher on the grid. So the teachers who have more uh, qualifications and experience, they, they're at higher end of the grid. So this grant makes up for the um, the difference between the average uh, teacher and what they are at. Um, the support for student funds, which uh, Roxanne had touched on, um, that's uh, one of the supplemental grants as well. And again, it's timed investment uh, until um, until we hear otherwise from the from the ministry. Um, a couple other large ones: uh, student transportation um, to support, of course, the transportation of students uh, to schools and specialized programs. Um, and then the other ones, uh, such as school facility operations, so that supports um, all the maintenance at the schools, utility costs, and so forth. Um, so moving on to the next slide. Um, so the next few will go, uh, highlight um, the special education grant and the components within it. Um, so the special education grant is made up of six components listed here. Uh, the special education per people amount, or SEPA for short, uh, differentiated special education needs amount, or DSENA for short, uh, special education or special equipment amount, uh, SIA, uh, special incident support, uh, incident portion, SIP, um, and so forth. So, as Roxanne mentioned, 
the special education grants are specifically for special education expenses and they can only be used for that. So anything that's left over needs to be deferred into the next uh, year for uses, the usage. So then just getting into each of the allocations specifically, uh, I won't go into, into too much detail, but uh, the first one is uh, based on uh, enrollment, essentially. It's a per pupil amount. So um, it's uh, allocated based on the number of students in each of the uh, grade levels. Um, the DCENA is uh, a little different. It's um, based on a, a number of uh, variable uh, measures that uh, the ministry does at their end. So things like um, board specific spec ed data, uh, EQAO scores, credit accumulation, and so forth. So that's uh, down at the ministry level and it's a tabled amount for, uh, for boards. Um, the SIA that is uh, to support uh, equipment uh, for students is uh, um, part of it is uh, given as a, uh, a base amount. So it's a flat amount. And then um, the rest of it is a per pupil amount, uh, special incidents. Um, portion is uh, claims based. So that supports um, uh, students who require two full time staff to address health and safety needs. So it is claims based uh, um, for those kind of incidences. So moving on to the next uh, slide, the ECPP. So that is to support students who are who cannot attend uh, schools, um, whether they're in a care or treatment center. So this would provide for staff to um, to uh, attend those uh, centers and uh, provide education to those students, as well as it supports uh, some of the resources uh, like supplies and whatnot, as well as um, the uh, school admin. Uh, well, it's not physical school, but the uh, principal and vice principal for uh, ECPP. And then uh, the last one there, uh, behavior expertise amount. So that supports uh, or provides re um, funding for uh, behavior analysts uh, that are employed by the board as well as training for them. Uh, so they support the school in, in that way. Um, and I heard and saw a hand. Uh, yep. I see Mel. So, yeah, Melissa, please. Ah! Hi, I'm sorry. Just, just to get some clarity, I guess, because you had mentioned that if there were ad, ad, like allocation money that had been carried over, like additional it would get carried over into the next year. Has there ever been an instance where there wasn't enough funding for students to be able to access this, especially with the instance of special needs identification on the rise? Um, so in the uh, in forthcoming slide, we'll, we'll show um, uh, essentially the dollars to uh, support to these allocations. And you'll see that um, we essentially actually don't have enough to cover everything. We actually spend more than um, than we are allocated, um, with exception uh, for the uh, envelopes, uh, the more specific enveloped ones. Uh, I'm thinking um, these uh, SIA. Uh, we don't uh, typically spend all of that in a year, so that gets rolled forward and um, again only spent on that purpose. Um, that's, uh, I think, the main one, yes, it is, uh, that gets carried forward. Otherwise, all the other ones um, are fully used up and, and some um, uh, to support um, the special education program um, in the form of, mostly in the form of staffing. Um, so you, you'll see that in a future slide, the numbers that uh, back that up. Um, so if there's no other questions, I'll just... Uh, Go through the rest of uh, uh, the revenue slides. So, um, so this slide uh, outlines uh, some of the allocations uh, in the GSN outside of special education that uh, help support uh, special education. So, um, some of the main, the, the first four are, are kind of the, the biggest ones. Uh, so, within the Pupil Foundation, there is a, a little chunk in there for uh, uh, professional and paraprofessional staff, such as. Uh, uh, SLPs, speech and language pathologists, uh, child and youth counselors, uh, social workers, and so forth. Um, and then the, I mentioned the cost adjustment for um, special education teachers that are um, higher on the grid and experience. Um, transportation, uh, I touched on. Um, and support for students, of course, that uh, Roxanne and uh, I touched on. Um, so then moving on to the next slide. Um, so these are um, the numbers uh to show um 
revenue year over year. So our, our current year versus uh, the prior year uh, budget. Um, so the, uh, again, the TSN is the largest amount, as you can see there, uh, 768 uh, million dollars for the year, um, which is an increase of uh, uh, over 26 million from the prior year. Um, the biggest things driving that are, of course, enrollments, um, and also there were um, some uh, PPFs or provincial grants, others uh, that moved from from there up to the GSN. Um, uh, the biggest one being the COVID uh, nineteen uh, learning recovery fund that uh, Roxanne had in one of the slides she presented. Um, so, um, but between the two, uh, it's um, uh, an increase year over year. Um, and then a couple other uh, large increases, uh, school generator funds, we expected uh, to return to more le normal level of uh, around 20 million as compared to the prior year uh, at 12. And uh, other fees and revenues, um, the biggest change there was in the education development charges. Uh, we're collecting more than uh, we have in prior years. And uh, I mentioned uh, deferred capital contributions uh, to offset our amortization expenses of uh, buildings and other assets. Um, I think I saw a hand or a question in the chat. Yeah, I think there was a, a hand up from Catherine. I had wanted to understand the difference between the accumulated surplus and the reserve fund and whether there are we talking the same thing? Like, is your accumulated surplus become part of your reserve fund or is, are we talking about different things? Uh, so, okay, so uh, we are talking about the same thing. Uh, um, so our accumulated surplus is made up of a number of uh, reserves for different purposes. Um, one off the, oh, off the top that is um, considered out of compliance, uh, which means it can't be used to address operating uh, deficits is uh, our education development charges actually that I just mentioned. Uh, so that's strictly for uh, land transactions, uh, land purchases. Um, but then we have an operating reserves uh, or accumulated surplus, uh, so the term is interchangeable. Um, for operating uh, um, needs, so so you have the right um, idea there. And and is the one percent that Roxana was referring to earlier? I think you were talking about seven something million, but I see in 2022, 2023, we're at twelve. That's because we're talking about multiple different reserve funds, right? And the seven is is one specific reserve fund that you can draw one percent from. Is that a correct interpretation? The seven and a half refers to the compliance part of the reserve fund, whereas the 12 million is the total, including the land um, right. and the future employee benefits and things like that, that the ministry considers outside of compliance. So for a compliant budget, we are allowed to use that operating portion up to 7.5 million. And that's the one we track. And that's the one that uh, trustees approve. What happens outside of compliance is a regulatory in nature uh, and is just stripped out of our operating budget uh, through uh, the allocation into the, that surplus. So 12, 12 million is the total, um, okay. which includes compliance and out of compliance. And one more question about the reserve fund. Um, since we seem to be incredibly reliant on it um, for special education funding and, and various things. Um, what kind of provincial regulations are there around um, the levels of reserve fund that you are required to keep as a board? Are there any or is it entirely at the discretion of the board? Excellent question. Another excellent question. Um, the ministry doesn't have a particular guideline. They do have a risk. They conduct a risk assessment on the financial um, viability of boards, both at an operating and capital level. Uh, and for an operating level, uh, they uh, are um, looking at boards that have at least 2% uh, in what they call an unencumbered or unallocated to anything specific uh, within an operating amount. So, um, they, they do have a measure where they flag boards that could be uh, in uh, financial distress, uh, where they need to closely monitor and make sure for those kind of boards, they will not allow you to spend up to 1% every year because you just simply don't have it in the reserves. And are there regulations around how you save or invest those reserve funds? 
we are not allowed to invest. So we are not allowed to have financial in- investments, uh, instruments. Uh, the only, uh, what we do have, uh, you've seen the investment income and actually it's going up now that the interest rates are going up. The only thing we can have is termed deposits, GICs and term deposits. We are not allowed to invest in stocks, mutual funds, uh, uh, or anything like that. So we do have a cash management strategy and uh, uh, look for opportunities to do term deposits as, as much as we can in order to maximize uh, the cash on hand and the interest income. And final question, I really promise. Um, several slides ago, uh, there was a discussion around grants around um, capital deficits. Does the board currently run any capital deficits for which you are currently required to maintain those that interest, et cetera? Or are you fully in a debt-free position as a board today? Um, we do not have a... a <laughs> So a capital deficit, uh, uh, we don't have a capital deficit because other uh, capital um, funds such as proceeds of disposition, uh, we were allowed to use that towards uh, bridging the gap between capital funding and the cost of building a new school. So I'm not sure if that's what you're referring to, but for example, the benchmark to build a new school is millions of dollars. It's, you know, 10 to 20 percent under what it actually costs to build a new school. So we have to go back to the ministry and say, well, the tender comes back. We are so many million behind uh, in terms of funding in order to bridge the gap. If we have proceeds of disposition, uh, which is a capital uh, uh, revenue that we would get from sale of land, uh, for example, um, then they would allow us, they, they would have to provide us approval to use that in order to top it up. And we've Ops, been doing okay. that. So, we've so been you're doing using well. six sale of lands to offset um, capital deficit from, say, all those new schools in Milton. Is that is that yes. what we're saying roughly? Okay. So then the grant, yes. but is the grant required to fully fill the gap if your capital, um, if you aren't able to recover through things like, sale of capital like unused uh, facilities so for a board that doesn't have proceeds of this position then they would go to the ministry and ask for additional funding um the ministry would come back and say uh take away and, and they still do it with us as well take away elements of your school take away certain areas that uh, would be nice to have uh and make it work within this parameter and typically the the ministry has provided a little bit more funding to school boards that don't have any other means. But for boards that do have proceeds of disposition, uh, we've been required to put that uh, money towards building, which means we're taking the proceeds of disposition that should have been invested back into an older building and uh, contributing to uh, building a new school, which should be fully funded. So right. that's been a concern because it's been going on for a few years. And I know there are discussions at the provincial level. They've heard us. We've been provincially uh, uh, mentioning over and over that the capital benchmark has to be adjusted because especially now with the, the cost escalation we've seen in the last two years, we don't have enough proceeds of disposition to build the schools that I've mentioned in my previous slides. Right couple of Milton schools and the, the two Oakville Ob- schools. Great. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So, Roxana, um, I know we're running out of time. Um, so, uh, just want to let you carry on um, because yeah. so far we're looking at the whole school budget and we on at the spec ed, yeah? <laughs> yeah. So, I think what we perhaps what we'll do is just um, – uh, quickly show you the expenses and then I'll pass, I'll pass it on to Vanessa in uh, the special education to walk you through that. So expense wise, I wanted to just highlight we spend most of it on instruction in the classroom. Uh, and in the, in directly in, uh, we also spend it on instruction through pupil accommodation, which is looking at the expenses to maintain the schools, the student transportation. And in other, it's, it's mostly school generated funds, which again, it's for the population and for the benefit of the students. So when you look at it that way, it's only 2.1% that we spend on administration of the overall system. Everything else is directly and indirectly spent 
for our students. So I'm not going to go through this. You'll receive the, the uh, slides. It just gives you a breakdown of what kind of expenses we have under each one of those categories. And then uh, the slide on uh, the numbers around that. Uh, the depiction between salary and non-salary, we spend about 89% on uh, people. Uh, they are our biggest assets. They're in front of our students and they support their learning and their needs. And then 21% is mostly to maintain schools, transportation, um, and uh, learning supplies and technology is mostly what's in there. So I won't go through all of that, uh, all these slides in the interest of time. Um it just gives you the breakdown for salary and non-salary in terms of what's in there. I'll pass it on to Vanessa, uh, I believe is Vanessa or Jay, uh, to go through the uh, just a few slides we have on particularly special education. Okay, and Roxana, before I do that, um, as we're now kind of at nine o'clock, I do need to seek um, approval from uh, the group in order to continue the meeting. Um, is uh, Could we just take a if we motion to continue the meeting to allow uh, Roxana to go through her uh, or the team to go through their slides, can uh, can I take a vote as to whether people would like to continue or whether they need to call the meeting at this time? Does anybody need to call the meeting right now? If you could let me know, uh, otherwise we will proceed, uh, I'm going to say, another 20 minutes in total. Okay, I'm not seeing any, uh, uh, can't think of the right word. Objections. objections. Yes, thank you very much. It's getting late. I'm um, not seeing any objections, so we'll continue this meeting for another 20 minutes. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. So, Jay or Vanessa, um, I will pass it on to you for the next few slides. Awesome, thank you. Thanks for having us, everybody, and I'll try to be quick because uh, I know we're, at, we're reaching the end of the day. Um, so just going over um, revenue, so specifically to uh, special education, um, this slide uh, overall total uh, special education revenue was 116 million. Um, and it, two, the two, sorry, two of the largest areas being uh, SEPA with 53 million and um, DeSena with 33.4 uh, million. Um, and then as Jay kind of went through what the different, uh, what the different grants mean, um, these are the numbers that go along with it. Um, so overall we were, uh, 3.5 or 3.6, uh, million over, uh, at revised compared to, uh, our financials for 21, 22. Uh, so the next one being, uh, expenses for special education. The total uh, amount of expenses um, was 134 million. Um, again, at revised for 2022-23, um, which was 4.5 million uh, higher than uh, at financials um, for at the end of uh, August 31st, uh, 2022. Um, so, and again, the largest categories in the expenses being um, salary, uh, as we noticed in the other slides. Um, so, the classroom teachers being about 50, uh, 53 million, and educational assistance, uh, specifically related for spec ed, uh, being 51 million. Um, and another large portion of it being the professionals and paraprofessionals uh, at four, about 15 million. So what does it all mean? In the next slide, we see um, overall spec ed had, an over, uh, had 17 million excess of expenditures over revenues um, for at, at revised. Um, and this was pretty much uh, just about a million over um, what was what we had uh, at the end result for financials. Um, so Overall, it's uh, 17, uh, 17 million uh, excess. And the next slide, we look at um, the staffing, so specifically the um, uh, FTEs related to spec ed. 
So overall, we have a total of uh, 1,632.6 full-time equivalents. Um, and of that, about there's 107.5 of those being temporary. Uh, so those are the ones we talk about that uh, where the funding is, um, uh, is, is temporary in nature. Sorry, can I just have to ask a quick question, just for clarification? The elementary teachers and the secondary teachers, are those the certs or, and self-contained teachers? Um, uh, yeah, just for clarification. Yes, some are certs and some are self-contained. Uh, some are um, uh, learning disability uh, teachers. So it's a mix. Okay, yeah, thank you. Go ahead, Vanessa. That was uh that was it for the uh for the FTEs. So yeah. back to you, Roxana. Perfect. So I have the last two slides. Uh and this is just looking forward. Uh we mentioned this before. We're looking at uh, how we can offset the funding that is being, um, it's one time. Uh, we certainly hope the support for student funds is going to continue. Uh, but we're certainly looking at what we absolutely need to, to retain and how we're going to do that using a portion and dedicating a portion of the surplus, uh, to support student, uh, learning, uh, mental health, uh, special education and, uh, other priorities, uh, and aligning them to the multi-year plan. So we're still working and formulating this. We need the grants for student needs to see where we're going. So we don't have a lot of information to share at this point. Uh, next steps uh, are to finalize the feedback into uh, the budget. Uh, and then by the time we come back in May, we should know more in terms of what those priorities are, the areas of funding returning or not. So we'll be able to have a more meaningful discussion uh, at that time. And uh, that is the end of our presentation. Thank you for your time and happy to take any other questions. Yeah, are there any other questions at this time? Yeah, Catherine. I'm so sorry. I know I'm asking a lot of questions. Um, is the per pupil amount set at a specific date or is it adjusted through the year as IPRC um, goes on throughout the year? Is it like whatever your enrollment is or identification is on a given date? Is that how they set the funding or does it adjust as your enrollment or identification adjusts? Um, so I'll, maybe I'll start, but Jay, who is uh, more into the technical paper, might uh, have, offer some uh, additional information. The per pupil amount is an amount set annually um, at the beginning in the grants for student needs. It's released at the beginning, and it's an amount, a certain dollar value per pupil, uh, based on an overall enrollment. If we're speaking in terms of uh, cases, incidents, uh, things like that, that will be based on volume during the year. So our funding will adjust in the revised budget and at the end of the year. So there's different allocations that will be funded differently or, or changed for the year. So it's... Okay, so... Sorry. So there's a target amount, but then there is room for adjustment through the year as your actuals come in in terms of student identification. Can I, can I just weigh in Roxanne? I, I think what Catherine was asking is like, and maybe you could clarify the the SEPA amount is about overall enrollment, whether we have more kids identified, whether kids come in from outside with special education needs, those don't impact um, that SEPA amount. Did my correct? Okay. So, it's yeah. only right, so it's only on enrollment and not on identified numbers, and they're just basing it on the average through the province of identification. This particular allocation, yes, it's based on overall enrollment, but then we do get, uh, uh, you know, based on a statistical model, and uh, it, it just looks at census data and different. Uh, um, uh, variability measures of variability those will change year to year but the ministry will say here's your table amount and then some of the rest of them that are uh, case-based will be differentiated based on right. uh, so that's the the differentiated special education needs amount allocation is the one that is specific to identification okay thank you uh, yes, and it's, it's a table amount for, for our board. So it's being provided by the ministry for us. 
can I, again, just clarify again, uh, from my understanding, we get, based on the enrollment that we have on the date the budget is approved or wherever it is, um, there is an amount that comes from the ministry for special education for a, an allocation based on enrollment, but also that differentiated, differentiated special education needs amount is just an amount that they do based on a table and it's still based on enrollment. Is that right? The first allocation is based on overall enrollment. So special education per pupil amount, it's enrollment goes up, this goes up. Yep. Um, the differentiated amount is based on a statistical uh, model on, on um, uh, measures of variability. So that one looks at, at specific special needs, but it's a point in time. And based on that point in time for our particular um, uh, region, uh, they put it through that allocation and say, okay, Halton, yep. you're getting this amount. And that's the the amount now it, um sorry and it doesn't go up like if we get more kids with with ieps we don't get more money through the year no i'm trying to think if the, any of that uh, i don't believe so uh because i i believe the rest of them are exceptional yeah. Yeah. Uh, needs uh that would receive more based on yeah so if, so if we have if we identify more kids there's no more money it's just basically what we get at the beginning of the year. Correct. Yeah. And then if we do have self-contained classes and open more classes, the funding gets pulled for, from the regular classroom teacher, the regular classroom allocation into special education, but there's not overall for the board, there isn't additional funding. Right. Okay, thank you. All right. Well, anybody else got any more questions? I know um, uh, where we, we, it's a very, very complicated subject. Um, there's a lot of learning to go on. And um, I thank you so much, Roxana, for presenting this. Um, and we're going to be, um, we'll be going through this all over again in uh, May uh, when you're going to come back to us and actually explain based on the numbers that you've got how that fits into what we actually have for special education. So I think then we'll have the opportunity to go into even more detail and, and really get at, okay, how did that work out and what, what can we actually use it for? So I want to thank you and the team for presenting tonight um, and for taking the time uh, to go through that so thoroughly. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Good night. Okay, we're now at item 3.0, um, out of respect of time, unless there's got anybody with anything super pressing, um, I would ask that um, we table any questions or discussion for the next session, um, unless there's something really pressing that somebody wants to raise. Okay. Um, Item 4.0, communication to SIAC. Uh, David, do you have anything to add? Uh, no, I thanks, uh, Alison. The, the update is there for your perusal. I just wanted to say uh, just one thing about the AT update. That's just a bit of a teaser for you. Um, it's, this is an area that obviously changes significantly. I remember when I was in uh, spec ed about 10 or 12 years ago, um, the devices that we were putting out into the system are so, so different from they are today, obviously, with the advances in technology and our, uh, the, um, the speed at which we were able to put them out also is significantly different. So if you want to learn a little bit more about uh, some of the neat things that are happening, I know our AT, AT team would be happy to come and share, uh, maybe do a bit of a hands-on kind of a thing with SEAC. So that's just there as a, as a bit of a, a good news update. And um, uh, number two, I'll leave that. If there's questions, we can certainly address those. And then number three was a request around SEAC representation. So that's really for uh, the chair, I think, to um, find a couple of uh, folks who might be interested in uh, sitting on a couple of board committees. And that's really it. I'm happy to answer questions if there are any. So are there any questions for the superintendent at this time? Again, in the interest of time, unless the accessibility thing needs us 
people right now. I'm going to table that for next uh, meeting. Um, in terms of association reports, does anybody have anything to add? Anything they want to raise? Uh, Sarah. Hi, I'll just do this really, really quickly. <laughs> um, only because March is Easter Seals Month. Um, so Easter Seals Ontario is proud to dedicate the month of March to raising awareness and support for children and youth with physical disabilities to the 76th annual campaign. March is Easter Seals Month. It also marks the launch of the uh, paper egg campaign. You've probably seen them up in grocery stores and that sort of thing in the past. That starts on March 17th. And I did have a blurb that I will ask Lauren if she could kindly um, send out that has a bit more information on all that because I don't want to take up any time. And I think that was it. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. Um, uh, it's in thank the minutes, you. and uh, we will make sure that everybody, uh, if you don't haven't received that, please let us know. Any other association reports at this time? Okay, and for the first time, I'm not going to be giving one. <laughs> <laughs> um, item 4.3, trustees report. Uh, so very brief this time, not a lot to share. Um, one thing I just wanted to note in case anyone didn't notice is that the school year calendar is out, so the 2023-2024 um, calendar. I noted that that's one of the committees that's looking for a SEAC representative. I believe it was you that was on it this year, right, Allison? Yeah. Um, that's a really important role um, if anyone is, is interested in that because um, it's an amazing experience in which all of these people come together to talk about the best way to create the school cal school year calendar that centers students in terms of what is best for preparation at the beginning of the year so that staff are ready to welcome students. And I know Allison brought up some really good points about giving staff time to read IEPs and giving EAs time to get prepared for their new students that are coming in. So that was a great experience as a new trustee for me. And that has now been finalized, assuming the ministry rubber stamps it. Uh, we do have our calendar. The only other thing I just wanted to mention is um, we do have uh, two student trustees who sit on the board with us. Their chairs are there. Um, so the two new student trustees were elected recently and they will be joining us in August. Um, something that they did in the schools for the first time, which is a great success is two of the high schools had in-person voting. And so students were able to actually experience what it's like for those of us who are 18 plus um, to go and, uh, and vote. And that was done in partnership with the municipalities. So that they had great turnout because of that at those two high schools. And so they're planning on expanding that um, in future years to other high schools. So that was uh, just one of those great things for students to get involved and a little bit of civic mindedness, which is always nice. So thank you. Great, thank you. And um, as we don't have any committees at this point in time, I imagine that there are no committee reports. Um, if anybody has any items for our next agenda or order paper, um, please could you let us know, Katie, myself, um, and we will bring that forward in the meeting um, where we look at the agenda for next month. Um, that being said, we are now at 9.15, and I thank you all for your patience. It's been a lot of learning, um, but really, really useful. So um, I want to thank you all for your time and commitment. And um, I will, uh, with this point, close the meeting. Thank you. <laughs>